Christmas story called The Beggar and the Bluebird. And because we are on live stream, I want to recommend that you buy this book from Amazon or your local independent bookseller. The author is a gentleman named Anthony Di Stefano, all credit rights reserved, and it is illustrated by a Mr. Richard Cowdery, who is a New York Times best-selling author. There we go. All right. Once upon a time, there was a bluebird who lived in the city. Like most birds, he flew south every winter to avoid the freezing weather. But one year, he had so much fun soaring above the big buildings and swooping down through the streets that he lost track of time and left much later in the season than he should have. It was already Christmas Eve, and the bluebird knew the first snowstorm of the season was about to blow through. Just before the bird departed, though, he flew down to the park to eat some bird seed that was thrown by a poor beggar. The beggar was sitting on a bench as he tossed the seeds into a dirt pathway. He had crutches and seemed like a nice man, so the bluebird started talking to him. Hmm. He told him that he was flying south for the winter so he could enjoy the warm sunshine and sing all day long. The beggar looked at him and smiled, and then he asked the bluebird to do him a favor. I don't have control anymore. Whoops, I got too much control. All right. Little bird, he said, the beggar. There's a homeless man that I know on the other side of the city. He hasn't eaten for days and is very hungry. I have a loaf of bread that was given to me by a kind person this morning. But I can't walk very well with these crutches. Will you please deliver the bread to him so he has something to eat? But I can't, the blue bird responded. I have to fly south for the winter. It's already getting cold, and I cannot survive the first frost. But the beggar persisted. Please do me this favor. The old man is starving and needs help, and if you don't give him this food, he may get very sick. There we go. So the bluebird agreed. He flew off with the bread to the other side of the city and thought, I hope this won't take too long. When he finally found the homeless man, he dropped the loaf of bread into his lap. It is a miracle, the man cried out as he began to hungrily eat the bread that had fallen from the sky. When the bluebird returned to the beggar, he told him how happy the old man was. He was about to set off for the south when the beggar asked him another question. Little bird, he said, there's a young widow I know who lives in a shabby, small shabby house nearby. She has two children and she's very poor. I have a few dollars that were just given to me. Can you bring them to this woman? She needs the money more than I do. Oh, but I can't, the bluebird replied. It's getting very cold now, and the sky is looking frosty. I simply must leave for the south. But once again, the beggar told the bluebird how much the young woman needed help. And once again, the bluebird agreed. So off he flew to the house where the widow lived and tapped on her door with his wings. When the woman opened the door, the bird dropped the money into her hands and flew away. The poor woman couldn't believe it. This must be a gift from heaven, she cried. Now I can buy a Christmas present for my children. The bluebird flew back to the beggar and told him he had given the widow the money. But now I really have to go, he said. I simply must fly south. He could feel the frost beginning to form on his wings and could see that the, a storm was moving into the city. Once again, though, the beggar pleaded with him to do one final favor. I know a sick boy in the hospital a few blocks away, he told the bird, and he has just about given up hope. He thinks everyone has abandoned him. And the beggar pulled a small cross from his pocket. This was given to me a long time ago, he said. If you bring it to the boy, it might make him understand that he's not alone, that God loves him. 
But this time, the bluebird insisted that he could not make the delivery. Don't you see, it's already starting to snow, he cried. And if I don't leave this second, I'm going to get caught in the storm and freeze. But this won't take long, the beggar assured him. It will bring so much comfort to the little boy. Please help him. The bluebird was frightened, but he was sorry for the child. No one should feel alone, especially at Christmas, he thought. And maybe I can fly extra fast. So flapping his wings as swiftly as he could, the bird flew like a shot through the sky. When he arrived at the hospital, he could see the boy sitting in his bed alone and sad. He tapped on the window with his beak. The boy looked over curiously. The winter storm had begun, and the bird was already covered in snow. The boy opened the window, and the bird carefully placed the cross in his hand. The boy didn't understand, but he realized that the bird was giving him something very, very special. As the bird flew off the ledge, the boy smiled at him, amazed at the gift he had received. By now, the bluebird was very tired. He struggled to fly back to the beggar through the driving snow, which had now become a blizzard. But he was so weak, he could barely keep his eyes open. When he finally landed on the ground next to the beggar, he closed his wings tightly around his little body in an attempt to keep out the icy wind. But it didn't do any good. He was freezing and exhausted, and he knew now that he would never see the south. The beggar looked at him with love. Are you sorry that you stayed to help these poor people, he asked. And the bluebird thought for a second. No, he answered, shivering. I'm glad I was able to make them happy at Christmas. But now I just have to go to sleep. Then the bird lay down, closed his eyes, and lay still on the ground. The beggar looked down at him and said, little bird, you were willing to sacrifice yourself in order to give others the gift of hope, and you will not die. The beggar stood up, dropped his crutches. His old tattered coat slipped to the ground. Then one by one, the pieces of dark, dirty clothing began to fall from his body. He started to grow larger, and suddenly, two huge white wings sprouted from his back, and a dazzling white light began to shine around his face. The beggar was not a beggar at all, but an angel. Do you believe in angels? Good. They are in the Bible. The angel picked up the bluebird, cupping him softly in his hands. He looked at him and said, you will not die. You will continue to sing your song. And then the angel spread his wings, leaped into the air, flying upward through the snow. Soon they were high above the clouds. The sun was shining brightly. And the angel flew toward it. The bluebird who had been sleeping felt the light from the sun on his face and woke up. He was amazed to see how beautiful the sunlit sky looked. It is so warm, he whispered. This must be the south. And then the angel released him and the bluebird flew into the sunshine, singing and happily flapping his wings. The end. I'm going to transition from this directly into an adult story. I love this children's story because the, the, the whole point of Christmas is service. And we make it that today because we know that that's the right thing to do. We know Christmas is, should be about giving other people gifts and doing things for others. But it's more than just the right thing to do. It's the whole reason Jesus was born. And I want to, I want to, I'm not sure how the slides, I, I should still have control, Micah. Um, I wanted to um, tell you a little bit of an adult story. It'll be about as long as that one. First of all, I want to show you a map of Jerusalem. And I, I intentionally pulled out that little sign, that little red cross there is the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Jerusalem. Did you know we had one there? Um, I've been there many, many times, and usually it, when I used to go, there would be maybe 40 members there. The services were in four languages, very annoying. Um, 
<clears throat> because the pastor, I think, was Italian and spoke Hebrew and English, and his wife spoke English and French, and she translated while he switched back and forth between English and Hebrew, she translated in French for the Ghanaian refugees that were also sitting in there. And so it was very hard for me to stay focused, I have to admit. But they were wonderful people, very uh, lovely little church. You can see that's right in the center of Jerusalem. You see the Dead Sea over here. Um, that's interesting, but not important. Um, I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit. You see that little red cross over there? That's the International Seventh-day Adventist Church of Jerusalem. And if you go to the right, if you could read it, you probably can't, but you will see the Western Wall, the Dome of the Rock, Temple Mount, al Aqsa Mosque. You will see, uh, well, it's just off to the right here, just out of your view, the Garden of the Gethsemane, the Mount of Olives. You can see that a little bit over on the right. This is you could walk from one side of this map to the other in about five minutes. It's very small. The city of Jerusalem is a very, very, very small place. And you see this dashed line kind of coming down through the middle. Everything on that side belongs to the Palestinians, and everything on this side belongs to the Israelis. Okay? So if you want to go to Al-Aqsa Mosque, although Israeli soldiers patrol it to keep it safe, it belongs to the Palestinians. Jerusalem is a very small place. See that little blue squiggly line down there, kind of on the, toward the bottom? That is um, the Pool of Siloam and the tunnels that Hezekiah drilled, dug through the rock to bring water to Jerusalem. This is what it looks like from a satellite. And I only show you this because if you look right in the center, you can see this gold dome on a flat white spot, and then just to the right of that, if you, could, if you can see contours, it drops off dramatically. Israel's, Jerusalem's on a very high spot, and then everything else just drops. Interesting, but not important. Zoom out a little bit. <coughs> We're kind of getting to my, my, the point of my story. Jerusalem is up there, kind of up in the upper left-hand corner. I kind of pull back and show you what happens when you walk out of Jerusalem going toward the Dead Sea. You just drop down through very torturous desert. Nothing there. But just a little bit to the south of Jerusalem is the town of Bethlehem. It's five miles away. It's in Palestinian territory, but it's five miles away. It's very, very, very close. So when, when we talk about Jesus being born in Bethlehem, it's, it wasn't far away from the temple and all the center of Judaism. And I want to show you just a little bit north of there, there's a place called Ramat Rachel, Ramat Rachel, and just right just to the north of Bethlehem is a place called Rachel's Tomb. And there our story starts. Because Rachel was famous for being a shepherd. It says in the Bible, the first time Jacob met her in Genesis 29, verse 9, it says, while he, Jacob, was still talking to them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherd. She was famous for being a shepherd. That's probably what attracted her to Joseph, or Joseph to her, one or the other. Interesting, but not important. A few years after that part of the story, we have another part of the story where in Genesis 35, 19, we are told that Rachel died, obviously many, many, many years later, and she was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. You can see her tomb is right there, right on the edge of Bethlehem. Over her tomb, Jacob set a pillar, and to this day, this was written quite a few years before any of us were born, to this day, that pillar marks Rachel's tomb. It doesn't anymore. But, and it says, Israel, that is Jacob, moved on again and pitched his tent beyond Migdal Eider, which is also known as the Flock Tower. The Flock Tower. Bethlehem is famous for sheep. Interesting, but not important. 
Now, in Micah, the book of Micah, chapter 4, verse 8, Micah says this about that very spot, that very spot where after burying Rachel, building a tower called Migdal Eider, or the flock tower over her grave, he camped there, and at that, that same spot, Micah says, And you, O tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come, the former dominion shall come, kingship for the daughter of Jerusalem. A prophecy about the Messiah, a prophecy about Jesus Christ, coming to the tower of the flock, the flock tower. The, have, you, have any of you ever wondered in the Bible when it talks about um, the angels, you know, angels we have heard on high, the angels come down and they announce that Jesus was born, and it says you will find him, what description did they give? Wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger, and they immediately dropped everything they were doing and went straight to where Jesus was. How would they know where he was? if all they knew was that he was in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes. Interesting, but maybe not important, is the fact that Bethlehem, most of the shepherds there were Levitical shepherds. They were priest shepherds. They were the shepherds that raised and cared for the flocks of sheep that became the sacrifices for the temple five miles away. And when... When lambs were born, baby lambs, what kind of lamb did it take to be a Passover lamb? Spotless, without blemish. They had to be a year old on the day of their sacrifice. So when a, when a lamb was born in the plains of Bethlehem, they wanted, to make, they wanted to check it. Is it male and is it perfect? And how do we keep it from injuring itself or becoming unperfect, we swaddle it. We wrap it in swaddling cloths so it can't move, it can't thrash, it can't hurt itself. And we put it in a stall. The Greek word that they use for manger is stall. Right? So, so if you were a Levitical shepherd, if you were a priest, if you were out in the fields at night and an angel came to you and said, the Messiah is born this very night, and you will, know, you will know where he is because he will be lying in a manger or in a stall wrapped in swaddling cloths. You would know right where to go. There was one place that you would go, to the tower of the flock. You would go to the tower of the flock because that's where they swaddled lambs, and they kept them in stalls when they were born. Now, this is all interesting but not important. The important thing is, is that, that to me the beauty of Christmas, among all the other things that I've already talked about that I love and, and you know, the decorations and family and the openness of conversations and all those things, the beauty of Christmas is that to me, Christmas, all roads in the Old Testament lead to Christmas. All threads, all all prophecies, all everything lead to Christmas. But then from Christmas, it leads in a straight line to the cross. Everything, everything is symbolic. Everything leads there. And one of my favorite um, new songs, new Christmas songs, um, it's now about eight years old. <laughs> and every year I try and think of a way to use it in a worship service and just there's never time or whatever. But this year, the artist who wrote the song and recorded it, just three days ago, recorded a video version of it. And, and I, wanna, I wanna play this for you. And, I, and, and she, she recorded this video version. She sings very distinctly and slowly so you can hear the words. But I want you to listen. This, to me, this song is divinely inspired to tell the story of all those interesting facts, maybe, that I just related, and wrap it all up in the story of Jesus. Oh, the call of 
the shepherd in a field nearby to tend and to carry his flocks by night. They were not ordinary sheep, they were set apart, born to be passed over lambs. And when a spotless male was born, he was held on the manger floor, swaddled up just to keep him calm until his time. And the shepherd sang, wrap this one up, here's a lamb without blemish, wrap this one up, he'll make his way.
I'd like to pray as we go out today. Heavenly Father, I am always amazed at Christmas time. When I take a minute and think about and try and kind of unpack Christmas, I'm always amazed that this was always the plan, that this is where all the roads led, that from the very beginning, this is the choice you made. And you came here knowing that once you came here, all roads led to the cross. Thank you for being our Savior. Thank you for coming for us. Thank you for being the only God who came for us. And I ask that we will go out this week and as we encounter people in our lives who at this time of year, they're a little more open and your Holy Spirit can open people up even more. Fill us with joy. Fill us with that message. Give us an opportunity to tell people what a wonderful Savior you are. We ask all this in your name. Amen.